Martin Luther, the father of evangelical hymnody, the one who gave a singing voice back to the congregation. Ryden writes, it was through the efforts of the great reformer that the lost art of congregational singing was restored and the Christian hymn, again, was given a place in worship. We gather for this hymn festival, did it occur to any of you, by the way, on Luther's 534th birthday. At least we think this was the day when he was born. Sometimes his mother wasn't so sure. But she did remember that he was baptized on St. Martin's Day, which is tomorrow. And baptisms usually took place the day after a baby was born. Eisleben, Saxony in Germany was his hometown, as well as the city where his life ended at age 63. His father was born and raised a peasant, but achieved some prosperity in the growing mining industry, and so was able to provide a fine education for his son. Young Martin was obedient to his father's wishes, studying to become a lawyer, but thunder and lightning one day changed the course of his life and he became a monk. His talents were soon recognized and his monastic superior assigned him to further studies leading to a university teaching position in the city of Wittenberg. Still lacking peace with God, in spite of all of his religious efforts, he finally met a merciful Savior through his studies in the book of Romans. Luther saw that the church of his day was badly in need of reform. And 500 years ago, he posted on the church door an invitation to academic debate that we know as the 95 Theses. He was totally surprised at the firestorm that this document ignited, and the following years involved him in one debate after another, causing his theology to mature in the process. After his bold and memorable defense, before the Imperial Congress in the city of Worms, my conscience is captive to the word of God. Here I stand, God help me, amen. He was officially declared to be an outlaw and now his life was in danger. But friends came to the rescue and secretly carried him away to a place of safety. While hidden in the Wartburg Castle, 1521-22, Luther now had time for intense Bible study. And this is when he translated the New Testament and portions of the Old Testament into common German speech. These months of immersion in the scriptures would provide a fertile seedbed for him to use his gifts as a musician. That was his nickname, by the way, at the university, the musician. And now he put the word to song. His first hymn was written the next year. And within one year, he produced 24 of the 37 hymns that he would write. And tonight we have the privilege of singing five of them. To Luther belongs the extraordinary merit, wrote historian Philip Schaff, of having given to the German people in their own tongue the Bible, the Catechism, and the hymn book, so that God might speak directly to them in his word and that they might directly answer him in their songs. He gave a singing voice back to the congregation. 
And for the first time, women's voices were also heard in church services. The focus of Luther's hymns as well as his writings was Jesus Christ. The hymns were typically written for the festivals of the church year or for certain parts of the worship services. He set out to reform the church from within, convinced that a major step in the process was providing hymns for the people to learn and proclaim God's truth and evangelical teaching. The first hymnal was published in 1524, containing only eight hymns. That was a small one. Four by Luther. It sold out rapidly, much to the dismay of Luther's opponents, and a second volume was produced with 25 hymns, 18 of them by Martin Luther. We have to include at least one quote from Luther Unleashed. A person who gives this some thought and yet does not regard music as a marvelous creation of God must be a clodhopper <laughs> indeed and does not deserve to be called a human being. He should be permitted to hear nothing but the braying of asses and the grunting of hogs. <laughs> and some more pleasant quotes. <laughs> the gift of language combined with the gift of song was only given to man to let him know that he should praise God with both word and music namely by proclaiming the word of God through music and providing sweet melodies with words. Music is God's greatest gift to us. The first of Luther's hymns that we shall sing together this evening is found in your small book. Number one, Dear Christians, One and All Rejoice. This is the first congregational hymn or chorale of the Reformation, appeared in print that first year. Uh, Luther's uh, hymns, other hymns of that period, have been referred to as chorales, and according to Pastor Waterman, these represent the best of the Reformation theology. For 500 years now, musicians have been composing special musical compositions based on these melodies. Famous musicians, including Johann Sebastian Bach. Just a few names of famous composers of preludes based on these choral tunes. The chorale is a clear presentation of sin and grace, law and gospel. It's kind of a word of testimony and gives great cause for rejoicing. You don't sing it and mumble it. It is meant to be sung exuberantly with spirit. Now there's a change of voice in the text, and so men are asked to sing verse 2 and women verse 7. Are you going to remember that? <laughs> men verse 2, women verse 7. And people in those days were hardier and did not uh, faint at singing that many verses to a hymn. <laughs> All right? Please stand as we sing together.
Our second hymn, uh, number two in your Reformation songbooks, From Depths of Woe I Cry to Thee, is one of seven hymns Luther wrote based on the Psalms and is considered to be the first funeral hymn of the Reformation. It was sung at Elector Frederick the Wise's funeral in Wittenberg, 1525, also sung at Luther's funeral, the service that was held at Halle, Germany, on February the 20th, 1546, before his body was moved to Wittenberg for burial in the castle church. Reflecting Psalm 130, this hymn portrays repentance, assurance of grace and forgiveness, and a certain hope, a certain hope for the believer in Christ. It's a fine tool for teaching salvation, and Luther used it as an example of the type of hymn that he hoped poets, other poets, would write for congregational singing. Hymn number two, and we have uh, five verses. I think we can handle that, okay? <laughs> Our next hymn, From Heaven Above to Earth 
I come is based on Luke chapter 2 and is intended as a Christmas hymn for children. It was the reformer's custom to arrange a festival for his family every Christmas Eve. And this hymn treasure was composed for one of those family occasions. The first five stanzas reveal the message of the angel. The next two draw us to the manger, and the last eight lead us in thanksgiving, prayer, and praise. It's said that Luther at one time had a man dressed as an angel come to his door on Christmas Eve singing the first seven stanzas. And Luther's children sang the remaining eight in response. Printed in 1535, this hymn soon gained uh, great favor and has been retained in, in most, uh, most Protestant hymnals. It's been used to bring comfort and assurance to the deathbed. And in the words of a devotional writer commenting on this hymn 100 years later, how highly must not then the human soul be prized in heaven, since the Lord Jesus Christ for our sakes did not spare himself, but willingly humiliated himself to such an extent and stepped down into this sea of human misery. Bach used this hymn tune in several of his compositions also. Now, first five verses, the angel's perspective. Verses six and seven, calling us to the manger. Eight and beyond, our perspective. And I'm going to ask if the women would sing verse 11 and the men sing verse 12.
last of our Luther hymns for now. Lord, keep us steadfast in thy word. The significance of the hymn uh, in uh, some of our heritage is evidenced by its repeated inclusion in nearly every uh, Scandinavian Lutheran hymnal, both in uh, the old country and in the US. At the time this hymn was written, the Germans were faced with a very dangerous foe. The armies of Islam were coming to the very gates of Vienna, possible invasion right into Germany. And for the friends of the Reformation, they wondered how soon the armies of the empire might be turned against them. According to Mr. Rodvold, our former music director, writing in the Concordia Companion, the papacy was fully dedicated to crushing the religious revolution in Germany, and the invading Turks imperiled their lives. In 1541, special prayer services were held to ask for the Lord's protection. And for one of these services in Wittenberg, Luther wrote this hymn, a hymn for the children to sing against our two arch enemies, the Pope and the Turks. <laughs> Consider the depth of this text written for children. Lord, keep us steadfast in thy word. And for us today, with different enemies, the hymn serves as a prayer that God would cause his word to continue to go forth and that his church would be protected. We sing together then Lord, as a prayer, Lord, keep us steadfast in thy word. believe that I'm calling on ushers at this time. But, but, okay, Pastor Rolf. I wasn't sure who was supposed to do this part. Huh? Thank you, Pastor Lee, for 
the wonderful background you've given us and a greater enriching our understanding of these wonderful hymns that Martin Luther has written. And uh, thank you, Parish Education, too, for making this booklet available to all of us to take with us tonight. Trust that it can be a great encouragement to you as you read the, uh, more of the background information and these hymns, too, and devotionals that are in this booklet. So thank you for that. The proceeds for our offering tonight will be going to our music ministry needs here on campus and upgrading our timpani. It's one of the needs we have. Um, during our offering this evening, we're going to be singing together the hymn, Now Thank We All Our God. It's number 145. And uh, the tune for this offering hymn was composed by Johann Kruger. Kruger is generally credited with invigorating the entire Lutheran hymn tradition. And he edited the most popular Lutheran hymnal of the 17th century. And many of his hymn tunes we still sing today. It's number 145. And as the ushers come forward, let's join our hearts in prayer. Oh, Father in heaven, we do give thanks and praise to you for your word. And Lord, we do pray that you would keep us steadfast in your word. We thank you, oh God, for using Martin Luther to declare your word in hymns. And as we have sung tonight too, we want to give thanks and praise to you, O God, from whom all blessings flow. Use these gifts that we return tonight in gratitude for the furthering of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand as we sing number 145 during the offering.
introduce the five solas or sole this evening, recognizing that some of us thought there were only three of them. More recently, we learned that there are five. Although all of them are certainly and clearly expressed in the writings of Luther and the other reformers, it may be a surprise to some to learn that they were not listed or cataloged by any in the way that we know them today. The first theologian, as far as I was able to find out, to systematically articulate them was Dr. Theodore Engelder, a Lutheran Church Missouri Synod theologian in 1916. And he listed only the three, grace alone, faith alone, and scripture alone. In the 1930s, a liberal German theologian substituted the glory of God alone for Holy Scripture alone. And it may not have been, in fact, till 1965 that a writer added Christ alone. At any rate, today, we have all five of them. And the 16th century church reformers would be fully in agreement with all of them. Amen. By proclaiming scripture alone, we are acknowledging that the Bible is our ultimate and trustworthy authority for faith and life. It is not the book that we worship, however, but the Savior of whom the book speaks. Quoting from the large catechism, at whatever time God's word is taught, preached, heard, read, or pondered. There, the person, the day, and the work are sanctified by it, not on account of the external work, but on account of the word that makes us all saints.
To say that we are saved by faith alone is to confess that we are sinners without hope who trust in the mercy of God alone as our only hope for salvation. Faith is not a work of our own, but a work of God within us, the empty hand that clings to Christ. Faith has an object, and that object is Jesus. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Christians say, saved by grace alone, we are acknowledging that we come with empty hands and are saved solely because of God's mercy in Christ. We are saved not because of the good things that we have done or even promised to do, but because Jesus did it all in his suffering, death, 
and resurrection. Grace is the loving attitude in the heart of God by which he views sinners as saints because of his son, Jesus Christ. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. To speak about the matter is easy, Luther wrote, but in the hour of temptation, it is very difficult to hold with certainty of heart that we possess forgiveness of sins and peace with God through grace alone to the exclusion of all other means in heaven and on earth.
when we say solus Christus, Christ alone, we are making more than a theological statement because this is a question of life and death. All are measured by the unchanging standard of God's law. And by nature, we stand condemned now and for eternity. The penalty of sin must be paid, and you and I are not able to pay it. From Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For rarely will someone die for a just person, though for a good person, perhaps someone might even dare to die. But God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ alone is our only hope for salvation.
When we proclaim to the glory of God alone, we are declaring that it is God and God alone who deserves to receive the praise and honor for the wondrous work that he has accomplished for our salvation. He has given us his word, which reveals our helplessness and the gospel of his son who did what you and I could never do. Salvation is all of his grace. Even the faith that receives it is a gift from him, not of our own doing. From 1 Timothy chapter 1, this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them. But I received mercy for this reason, so that in me, the worst of them all, Christ Jesus might demonstrate his extraordinary patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now to the King Eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen.
might be an appropriate time for applause. Stay standing, please. <laughs> because that is a long-standing custom to stand during the singing of our final hymn. A mighty fortress is our God, needs very little introduction. Luther's most popular hymn, sometimes called the battle hymn of the Reformation, based on Psalm 46. There are two versions for this vigorous hymn. The original music written by Luther is very rhythmic and syncopated. The repeated notes at the beginning may bring to mind perhaps the hammer blows of nailing the 95 theses to the castle church door. Luther's rhythmic melody is included in the uh, Reformation hymns booklet that you received, which you are taking home with you, I trust. The second version is the so-called smoothed out version, which came into being some 200 years after Luther and is the version used in most hymn books today. And sometimes Christians are surprised that it isn't the original. Uh, please notice that we're following the words in your program and our choirs will be singing the third verse. <laughs> 